Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm virtually David and you can probably guess what we're tearing down in this episode. These things are awesome. Okay, for the context of this teardown, I'm actually going to continue to call it the Oculus Quest 2, probably abbreviated to the Quest 2. Meta, first of all, apparently I struggle to say it a lot, um, but second of all, this still has a big Oculus on the front, so I'm going to call it Oculus. So if you haven't seen one of these before, this is an all-in-one VR headset, which means all the hardware required to run basic applications is on board. It's battery powered, you're not tethered to anything. I was skeptical because I actually got a chance to try the very first re-release version or the developer kit for the Oculus Rift when it first came out in 2016, 17, and then a year later when they got to beta hardware, which was very close to what was released for the consumer. And the leap between those two was amazing. The tracking difference was noticeable. But VR applications still have to be on a big high-end gaming PC. So to see something like this all in one was a bit of a shock. Start. How do we start? So after the Oculus Rift, which required external hardware, I believe the, was it the Oculus Go was the first all-in-one? And I seem to remember that wasn't all that amazing. But this, I'm pleased to report, is great fun. So we do have a series of very tiny screws, six of them, I can just see in here. Looks like this one could do with a bit of anti now. If you've not played or used or even followed anything in VR, one of the first things you'll probably notice is this down here, which is two functions. It's, first of all, it gives you a little number readout. It shows your interpupillary distance, which is how far apart your eyes are. And without that, the Fresnel lens, or the compound lenses that make up the two main eyepieces, won't be dead center in front of your eyes. So you need to adjust that to suit you. And just above it, so that, that number there changes, and just above it you've got a proximity sensor, which is, as far as I can work out, very, very similar to the one on your phone, which turns the screen off when you hold it to your head in the middle of a phone call. I'm imagining that's just a little uh, infrared uh, LED and receiver. So think about what is involved in generating a smooth VR experience. So you've got either one screen split down the middle or two screens, but either way, very high resolution screens. Accelerometers for tracking. Quest 2 actually has four onboard cameras, which have real-time tracking on them, or appear to at least. You've got sound processing, because you've got onboard speakers. And it's not really surprising that you think you would need a big high-end PC driving this. Okay. So face guard, oh, yeah, leads to the proximity sensor. There's a little zero, zero insertion force connector, but with a little bit of adhesive on the other end. Really nice high density little connector on there. And wow, all of a sudden that thing is haunting my dreams. A very early prototype of Batman's cowl maybe? Ooh, okay, um, maybe the front comes off next. See, anybody that's tried VR and is under the age of, let's say 20, would be forgiven for thinking that VR is a new thing, but uh, it's not. This is not the world's first foray into trying to create virtual or immersive reality as a, as a thing. And long-time viewers will probably remember when Ben Heck did a repair for the, what was it called, that Game Boy VR headset? Is it the VR boy? Something along those lines. And also, for me personally, my big memory of it was the classic 1996 film featuring Sinbad uh, called First Kid, which follows the son of the president. And he liked to run away from life as the first boy and go to the mall and play on a VR kit. And this is what it looked like. That was close. Cool. 
Game over. You're dead. And I think I can understand why that was nausea inducing. The low frame rates, the low fidelity, low latency, everything. Yeah. So this is definitely a whole different ball game. And this is a tiny little thing where the entire kit fits on your face. And there is a lot inside this tiny little device. And you bear in mind how much of this is actually occupied by the optics here. And you consider that the rest of that is the hardware that drives it. That's impressive. Black and red lead coming this side. I'm gonna guess that's an audio connection. The cable is dressed through this camera sub-assembly. And these are eight screws holding down this little plastic assembly at the front. I'm gonna say that's over the top, but it seems like a lot. And bearing in mind how little these actually sell for. I mean, if you think you can pick one of these up for $300, or well, 300 pounds, and you consider what hardware must be inside, and compare that to what I'm assuming is a high-end mobile phone that these days retail for about a thousand pounds. I've got to assume that Facebook are making a loss on selling the hardware and are in this for selling the apps and the games. Well, maybe I should have said that. I don't know if that was obvious, but there's a, a, an entire marketplace for you can buy Oculus games in here. And of course, that means the money. What's interesting though is you can actually plug this into a PC and use this with that PC to uh, play other VR games. I don't know how many there are, I haven't tried it yet, and I don't think any of the computers I've got have got decent enough graphic cards to drive the thing, but an interesting prospect. Okay, we've got coax lead coming up here for the wireless, or an antenna, that might be Bluetooth. Based on its position, this little antenna on the front would make sense if it was for the controllers. Uh, I know these attract optically using infrared lights as well, but the connectivity is wireless, so it would make sense if there was an antenna at the front at the bottom, which is where that would be, just about where your nose is, to give you the best coverage. So this, this little ribbon comes down here to the volume button. This one comes down here as well, and there's no volume rocker this side. Uh, we do have holes, which I assume for now are the microphones, which are just above your mouth in stereo. So that seems a possibility. Ooh, is that the battery connector? basically a clamp to hold the battery connector on. Uh, USB-C, USB Type-C connector up here for charging and uh, data and that comes straight up here onto the motherboard. That has all the hallmarks of a battery connector on it. And that one comes around here, tucks up there. So where is the battery? Or oh, is it this big brick at the top? That's frightening having a battery that close to your forehead and eyes. Okay, so the heat sink has a sensor attached to it. Which leave the fan, or oh, sorry, I'm gonna call this a plenum. Which may or may not be correct, depending on what it's actually used for. But there is a ribbon cable just wrapping around to something there, and I don't even know what that is. There's nothing outward on the plastic, it's just, and of course that ribbon cable is not accessible either. So I've just got to be very, very careful as I take that apart. Fan-shaped heatsink. Can I just describe it as that? And that kind of shaped heatsink reminds me of, oh, I don't know, 2005, 2006 with the totally no noise heatsinks from Zalman, for example. They came up with some crazy designs and they were always awesome, but I could never afford one at the time. An RF cage. I'm guessing that's for the uh, Wi-Fi. Got two antennas, and I think that's probably Bluetooth or whatever connectivity it uses on the controllers. Pop that last antenna off. Get these screws out the motherboard, and maybe we can progress. Oh, let's get the screen connector off. Oh, front and back heat sinks to so this heat spreader. So it's obviously a lower thermal load, but still enough that they've worried about thermally conductive pads. Interesting touch. Well, despite getting this entire assembly out, all I can see is this little ribbon cable disappearing in there, so I may as well get that off. Oh, we can sort of discard that. We'll come back to it though, because I still think there's plenty on there worth it, worthy of our attention. So I'm just looking at the thermals here. So you've got this fan, but I can't really work out where it's bringing the air in from because there are no sort of obvious slots or inlets anywhere, to be honest. 
So I think that's probably just bringing in air sort of around the bottom where your nose sticks out through the thing, sort of from this area or here. Brings it up and then ejects it at the top up here. Does that blow air back around the optics into your face? As in sort of blowing through here to clear your eyes? Because that would actually help it stop getting sweaty and steamy around your eyes. Which, if anybody's ever worn like scuba diving mask for any length of time, will know that's exactly what happens. And I've not particularly experienced that wearing this. So I wonder if that's partly to cool the electronics for the comfort of the user. That would be an interesting technique. Is that a tiny little hall effect sensor? Like receiving feedback from the interpupillary distance settings? And then whatever that is on the same little flex PCB. A lot of grounding here. So that's the screen assembly with the optics. And that screen will be not really any different from like a mobile phone screen. In fact, compared to my phone, it's pretty much the same size screen. And this is probably a very similar resolution as well. This is a QHD screen, so it's very possible that's the same. So you're basically having the optics isolating left from right, and then the lens over the top. When you adjust the interpupillary distance, do they have to have feedback on which position this is in so they can recenter the image on the screen because the image has to bump slightly in and out as well. Okay, so yeah, that could well be a reed switch or something going to that assembly here that gives the system feedback on interpupillary distance. So you're then left with the heat spreader and four cameras. Now these cameras are gonna have super wide lenses because uh, as far as I can tell, their field of view overlap with each other because um, the hand tracking in 3D is so accurate in terms of even your finger positions. It has to be stereoscopic machine vision. So like 3D vision, and you can only do that if you have two cameras seeing the same object at the same time, unless you're going down the route of radar, LIDAR, LIDAR ultrasound, something along those lines. So those cameras are gonna have super wide lenses. Um, but in terms of the actual camera hardware, it really doesn't look any different from like the Raspberry Pi high quality camera. The final thing I'll say about these cameras is I'm suspicious they are infrared cameras um, because you, it will tell you off if you don't play in enough ambient light um, but you only ever see through this in black and white or a pseudo monochrome image which could mean they're seeing mostly in the infrared range which means you don't get colour definition. Well, I don't know if you're a fan of Facebook or whether you're a fan of VR uh, whether you think this is a good idea or fun or what, but if you're an electronics engineer or somebody interested in electronics, and since you're watching an Element 14 show, I assume you are, this is impressive. The thought and attention to detail that has gone into a very high-end product, which like I say, I assume they're selling at a loss looking at the hardware involved here. It's got some very neat little features. The fact that the cooling fan blows the air back over your face so you don't get sweaty unnecessarily. The use of sort of sound pipes to get the sound to your ear so you can have a bigger driver without the extra size. There's so many clever ideas here. And beyond all of that, all of how it's built, I really would encourage anybody that can lay their hands on one, buy one, borrow one, Go try it out. It really is an experience and the performance they've squeezed out of this otherwise phone level hardware is amazing and really good fun. So why not head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Let me know if you've had any VR experiences. Is it modern gaming hardware? Is it all in one combined hardware? Or was it something vintage from when the VR took off in the 90s? Let us know and we'll see how everyone's experiences stack up. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.